Hello all and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another Take 5 for Florida History. This is the third video in my series exploring the St. Johns River. The first two are an introduction to Florida's longest river and an exploration of its origins. While you don't need to see those two before watching this one, please watch them. I'll have two more after this, one on the lower river and one on its significant tributaries. The river can be divided into three basins, and today I'm looking at the middle part, from Lake Monroe in the south to just north of Lake George in the north. This part can be easily separated from the upper river, as historically it's the furthest point of commercial navigation. It can be divided from the lower river, the part that reaches the Atlantic, because it's still generally a narrow river, with the exception of passages through several lakes. The St. John's is 310 miles or 499 kilometers long, and the middle part is just a quarter of its overall length, running from Lake Monroe, which lies between Seminole and Volusia counties, to the town of Willatka, north of Lake George. Beginning at the second largest city on the river, all intern areas settled by indigenous communities thousands of years ago, and visited by an important 18th century British explorer. Then I'll get to some of the most remote areas along the St. John's, on the way to Florida's second largest lake, which has an unusual military connection. Finally, I'll briefly look at two historic car ferries, an unusual canal, and one of the country's national fish hatcheries. My trip today begins at Sanford. Not counting Jacksonville, which is one of the biggest port cities in the U.S., Sanford is the only large city on the St. John's. Still, compared to Jacksonville's population of nearly a million, the 62,000 residents of the city on Lake Monroe pales in comparison. Behind me is Lake Monroe and part of the Sanford Marina. As early as 1800, there was a trading post located here. This was when Florida was still officially Spanish territory, but the land was heavily encroached upon by U.S. settlers. After the U.S. finally took control of the peninsula in 1821, white settlers were clashing with Seminole communities, so the U.S. Army built a fort on Lake Monroe in 1836. Initially, it was named Fort Monroe, though after an 1837 skirmish, it became Fort Mellon, named after the only U.S. soldier killed in the fight. Charles Mellon. Within a few years, steamboats on the St. John's from Jacksonville were regularly heading south and the new settlement of Mellonville was their final stop. At first, the steamboats brought settlers and provisions, but soon they began to ship out lumber, turpentine, citrus, and more perishable crops such as celery and cabbage. By the 1850s, tourists were regularly visiting Mellonville and later, after the Civil War, they would visit the new city of Sanford, which was developed next door. Because of the St. John's and relatively new steamboat technology, much of the area south of Mellonville and Sanford, including Orlando and Kissimmee, would be developed in the later part of the 19th century. As I mentioned before, Lake Monroe is the furthest which commercial boats could navigate on the St. John's, but Sanford wasn't the only city on the lake. Situated opposite Sanford, on the North Shore, is the settlement of Enterprise. Founded in 1841, only two years later it became the county seat of Mosquito County, which would be renamed Orange County later on. By the early 1900s, economic development would pass Enterprise by as its access to areas away from the St. John's became reached easily by the railroad. This also happened to Sanford, though their main rail line into the Orlando area passed through the city, thereby aiding its development. I covered steamboats in the introductory video of this series, as well as a recent video on the development of Florida tourism in St. Augustine. The topic of steamboats of the St. John's will be a regular theme on this channel. 
As you can see in this ad from 1900, it not only lists trips to Florida, it shows connecting trips along the St. John's to Palatka, Sanford, and Enterprise. Located just to the west of Sanford is Wayside Park. It's where Lake Monroe narrows back into the St. John's on its slow run to the ocean. This Seminole County Park provides a good look at how transportation shaped the interior of the Sunshine State for the past 180 years. Imagine steamboats of the 1840s cruising by here, transporting settlers, agricultural products, enslaved people, and tourists from Jacksonville to Lake Monroe and back. Imagine the railroad entering the area in the 1880s to slowly take over from the steamboats and eventually crossing the river at this point. Imagine the first bridges for cars and trucks, such as the swing bridge shown here. The Lake Monroe Bridge, built in 1932, was the first electrically operated swing bridge in the state and replaced a wooden bridge that was manually operated. The Lake Monroe Bridge was the primary entry point to Sanford across the St. John's until 1960, when the construction of Interstate 4 added a new bridge to the east. That was replaced in 2004 by the St. John's River Veterans Memorial Bridge, which you can see here. Another bridge would be built to replace the Swing Bridge in 1994. Today, Wayside Park continues to be a place where you can watch tourists traveling to Disney World and beyond on Interstate 4, as well as those taking Amtrak and Amtrak's auto train into the Orlando area. By the way, I did a video on the auto train. You can check it out here. From Lake Monroe, the river resumes a northerly route and enters an area that's heavily forested instead of the wide grasslands that shaped much of the upper St. John's. This is Florida's central uplands, which includes numerous state forests and parks as well as the Ocala National Forest. At first, the river passes to the east of this area and it's here where we find Blue Spring and Hontoon Island State Parks. Blue Spring State Park is one of the state's most popular parks and is the location of the first major spring that feeds the St. John's. With a flow of about 102 million gallons or 390,000 cubic meters of water per day, it's one of Florida's 33 first magnitude springs. The spring is only 2,000 feet or 610 meters away from the river and is thus considered the largest spring on the river. One of the reasons that the park is so popular can be seen on cool Florida winter days. The water temperature of the spring stays a constant 73 degrees Fahrenheit or 23 degrees Celsius, which provides vital warmth for manatees that live in the St. John's. Air and water temperatures drop. While manatees don't regularly spend much time in the Blue Spring Run, a cold snap can see the manatee population spike to over 500. For more info, check out my video on the manatee, one of Florida's official state symbols. Another resident of Blue Spring Run isn't as beloved as the manatee. This part of the river is much like other rivers and lakes in the state in that it's populated by the blue tilapia. Native to northwestern Africa and the Middle East, the fish, which is popular in the U.S. as a food source, is also considered an invasive species here. A recent fish count of Florida's Silver Springs revealed alarming results. Blue tilapia now make up 86% of the biomass, or weight, of the total fish population there. This coincides with declining populations of native fish and the overall declining health of the springs. While they shouldn't be here, it's relatively easy to see the tilapia's fascinating spawning behavior. These photos are of a male. During mating season, a male digs a circular nest with its mouth, as you can see here. The male swims out to a passing female and leads her to the nest for courtship. If correctly wooed, the female then lays her eggs. He fertilizes them, after which she takes him in her mouth and swims off, possibly to mate with another male. The eggs will hatch in the female's mouth and the fryer release to feed, but whenever threatened, they return to the mouth until they're about three weeks old. This type of parental care is called mouth brooding. 
On the western shore of the river, directly across from Blue Spring, is the southern end of Hantoon Island. This state park is made up of a 1,650-acre or 667-hectare island that's surrounded by the main channel of the St. John's as well as Snake Creek and Dead River. It's a good size island, being about two-thirds the area of Key West. Hantoon can only be reached by boat, and luckily the state park provides one for visitors. Named for an early owner, William Hunton, it's one of the many places throughout the state where significant evidence of thousands of years of habitation by humans can be seen. Archaeologists have determined that people have lived on or near Hantoon for at least 12,000 years. The island is a remarkable place with a huge midden or ancient trash mound. This helps us understand that the St. John's wasn't just a significant roadway into central Florida for Europeans, but for thousands of years provided an abundant source of food and tools, as well as a way to connect many separate indigenous communities. This is one of the many areas on the St. John's where it's possible to connect with the intrepid British explorer and naturalist William Bartram. Though he lived in the latter 18th century, his travels through Georgia and Florida between 1773 and 1777 are still considered to be one of the most important studies of the area's nature, geography, and indigenous cultures. His travels in Florida were equal to that of the much more celebrated Lewis and Clark expedition some 30 years later, and took the explorer by foot and by boat from Mamelia Island all the way south to Blue Spring. I'll be doing a video on his remarkable travels at some point. Near Hontoon, in fact the island partly borders it, is Lake Beresford. At 800 acres or 324 hectares, the Long Lake is fed and drained by the St. John's near Hontoon. The Volusia County Park, located on the east shore of the lake, is heavily wooded with nature trails and a paved trail along it. Each time I've visited, I've seen lots of nature, including butterflies, dragonflies, turtles and cooters, and osprey. If someone is visiting the Deland area, I'd recommend stopping by. There are two other lakes on the way to the massive Lake George, Lake Dexter and Lake Woodruff. Both of these lakes are in a forested area that's undeveloped and generally contained within state and federal lands. Lake Woodruff is connected to the St. John's, but it's primarily fed by another powerful spring, the Leon Springs, which produces 20 million gallons or 91,000 cubic meters of water a day. Lake Dexter is connected to Woodruff by Tick Island Creek. How cool a name is that? and the St. John's passes through its western section. Just north of there is the village of Astor. It's on the east side of the Ocala National Forest and of course on the west shore of the St. John's. There's about 1,500 residents and its economy is dependent upon tourism connected with the St. John's, the National Forest, and hunting preserves. While Astor developed during the time of the steamboats, once the railroad was built along Florida's coast, it was the beginning of the end, much like Enterprise. By the way, one of the reasons I mention Astor is that the bridge which connects Volusia and Lake Counties is the last one that crosses the river until Palatka some 48 miles north. This will be an important fact a little later on in the video. The next place to visit after crossing the bridge is the Blue Creek area just south of Lake George. As the St. John's nears the lake, it creates a delta with a main channel and several smaller ones. There's an isolated neighborhood of about 15 homes along the creek known as Blue Creek Lodge. It may come as a surprise to people, but there are numerous rural areas throughout the state such as this. Indeed, there is yet another neighborhood just a short distance away near the only boat ramp directly on the southern half of Lake George. George is the second largest lake in Florida after Lake Okeechobee. It's 72 square miles or 186 square kilometers in size and like all of Florida's large lakes, it's essentially an extremely shallow basin with an average depth of only 8 feet or 2.5 meters. This means that even on the large lakes of the St. John's, the steamboats had to be very careful when they navigated. 
While they generally had shallow drafts, it was still typical for them to draw seven feet or just over two meters of water. The lake is also known as Lake Wallaka, which is believed to mean chain of lakes in the Timucua language, though it's not known if the Timucua actually called it by that name. There's an argument to be made that the river was called Wallaka, as the Timucua were well aware of the many lakes the river passes through. It's hardly the only chain of lakes in central Florida. There will be a video on that someday, too. By the time William Bartram visited the lake, it didn't have an official name, so Bartram named it in honor of his king, George III. This makes it one of the few geographic places in Florida to have a name directly connected with Britain. Amelia Island is another. It's named for Princess Amelia, the daughter of King George II and aunt to George III. I don't know if this means that Lake George is related to Amelia Island or not. Despite its size, Lake George is quite a bit like each of the St. John's other lakes. It's undeveloped, with only the occasional grouping of homes along its shore. Even Georgetown at the northern tip is little more than a collection of homes with bait shops, convenience stores, restaurants, and bars. Everything the average angler needs. The lake shore is lined with notably tall bald cypress and Florida slash pines on the slightly higher points. The Lake George State Forest is an excellent place to explore the natural forested area. One can occasionally even see the results of the state's prescribed burning actions as well. There are roads to explore, some leading to the lake, that allow for great wildlife viewing. This is the realm of the rarely seen black bear, the 700-pound or 318-kilogram omnivore that haunts much of central uplands on both sides of the river. Along the river, Florida native apple snails are common, though you will generally only see their shells on shore after harvest by limpkins or snail kites. Take a look at the aquatic plants nearby and you might see the next generation of apple snails in a pretty pink mass just above the waterline. The gopher tortoise can also be seen here along with white-tailed deer. Florida's deer are quite a bit smaller than those in the rest of the U.S. and come across more like Bambi than a serious target of hunting. The western shore of Lake George borders Ocala National Forest. The forest, established in 1908, encompasses the largest part of the central section along the St. John's, which adds to the feel of isolation on the lake. Ironically, in one unique way, that sense of isolation is regularly shattered. Associated with the Pine Castle bombing range, located in the National Forest, there's a large rectangular section of the lake that's controlled by the U.S. military. It's the only lake in the state used as a bombing range. Various targets have been placed in the lake for aircraft to attack with dummy bombs. Prior to the range's use, low-flying aircraft announced the impending danger to make sure civilians get well away from the area. While some people suggest this is a shocking secret, it's been going on since World War II. In fact, the name Pine Castle Bombing Range comes from the Pine Castle Army Airfield, which was established in 1942 near the city of Orlando. In the post-war period, Pine Castle would become McCoy Air Force Base and in the 1970s would be converted to civilian use as Orlando International Airport, today the busiest airport in the state. The bombing range is explained in signage at all boating areas around the lake and not surprisingly, everyone in the area is quite familiar with the regular bombing runs. Despite the amount of military hardware dropped in the lake, it's considered to be one of the cleanest in the state. At Georgetown, at the north end of the lake, there's a boat ramp that's located next to a ferry landing. This is the Drayton Island Ferry, one of three car ferries that cross the St. John's. At one time, ferries were common throughout the state, which is ringed by about 1,000 miles or 1,609 kilometers of barrier islands and keys. Today, however, they're all but an anachronism and exist only on the St. John's. 
This ferry connects the island to the eastern shore. It can accommodate two vehicles at a time and operates about three times a day. First opened in 1943, the ferry services the 40 or so households that are located on the island. Drayton Island is privately owned, including the indigenous middens on the north side, which are believed to be owned by the Archaeology Conservancy of Albuquerque in New Mexico. As the St. John's narrows back to a river, it passes another interesting spot. As can be seen here, it's a neighborhood with a rather unusual circle canal with an island. Here are some quick views of the canal, or is it a lake? Either way, it's one of those odd things I've run across as I've explored the state. The second car ferry is not far away and fully crosses the river. The Fort Gates Ferry is located on a left-handed dogleg of the river. I won't go into too much detail about the ferry in this video, but remarkably it was established in 1853. As I mentioned before, the only two bridges in this area, those at Astor and Palatka, are nearly a 50-mile drive from each other, and so the Fort Gates Ferry provided a valuable shortcut for cars and trucks. As you can see, it's a small ferry, barely holding four cars. Sadly, it's not currently in operation, having been damaged during Hurricane Irma in 2017. Our final stop is the town of Wilatka and the National Fish Hatchery. The town of about 700 residents is on the east side of the river and is across from the point where the Oklawaha River joins the St. John's. Wilatka is yet another of the sleepy communities that we've seen with its minimal economy based on fishing and hunting. It's one of the many places where Floridians and tourists alike converge to explore the watershed. A fish hatchery was created in Wilatka in 1926 by the state of Florida. Twelve years later, the state turned its operation over to the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries. In 1940, the Bureau became part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which has managed the Wallachia Hatchery ever since. For the uninitiated, a hatchery is a place for the breeding, hatching, and rearing of fish and shellfish. The National Hatcheries website describes its mission as being charged with producing Atlantic striped bass for the St. John's River in order to maintain the population for ecological, historical, and economic purposes. It also works with Gulf Coast states to produce and protect Gulf of Mexico striped bass and has begun work with two federally listed species, the federally threatened eastern indigo snake and the federally endangered Florida grasshopper sparrow. The hatchery operates a small aquarium as can be seen here. When I say small, I really mean small. It's a great place to stop if you're passing by, but otherwise it's up to you. It contains several fish tanks with mostly native species. I love the look of the gar, and the largemouth bass I met was quite friendly and was interested in my camera. I hope to return one day and see if I can arrange a tour of the facilities. It's at Wilaka and its confluence with the Oklawaha that the river enters its lower basin. Just north of the town, the river widens and finally reaches its maturity. That's where I'll begin the next video in this series, looking at the Palatka area and heading to the Atlantic. Apart from widening, the lower section of the river is also where it becomes brackish. The river moves so slowly that it's a tidal river with seawater pushing up to St. John's during high tides. The Middle Basin is a place of clear water springs, clean lakes, dense forests, abundant wildlife, and evidence of 12,000 years of human settlement. While it's the same river, the center section of the St. John's is rather different from both the upper and lower basins. It's a place where tens of thousands of visitors fish and hunt every year, as well as explore the river and its lakes by every manner of watercraft. And remember, this isn't something that developed recently. Tourists have traveled along the St. John's since the 1840s. This part of the river and nearby St. Augustine are where Florida's vacations began. 
Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and check out my many videos on Florida. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.